When Intel announced that they would be developing discrete graphics cards roughly two years ago, I, and well, everyone else, took it with a massive grain of salt. I mean, sure, maybe improved integrated graphics or the enterprise getting something ludicrously expensive to accelerate AI, that sounds pretty credible, but a real GPU that I can hold in my hands? Well, as it turns out, it's in my hand right now. And I fully believe that some really great things are going to come out of this. But I'm still skeptical that Intel will ever turn this into a real product for gamers, even if I would love to be wrong. This CES video is brought to you by Pulseway. If you enjoy getting work done while not at work, then you need Pulseway, the software that lets you remotely monitor, manage, and control all your IT systems from one app. Try for free and get 20% off their Teams plan when you sign up at the link below. This is not the first time that Intel has created a graphics card, and the story of the DG1 starts many years before I was born, back in 1963. The Apollo mission was in full swing, and NASA decided the best way to visit the moon was to have one module land on the moon while another stayed in orbit, but getting those two modules to reconnect safely would need to be mastered before the plan could go ahead, since if the two modules failed to reconnect, everyone died. To properly train the astronauts on how to dock, NASA created the Rendezvous Docking Simulator, and inside that was the real-time image generator created by GE Aerospace, essentially the first graphics card ever. Over the next 30 years, GE Aerospace would improve on their simulator, and at some point, an engineer hopped in there and was like, uh, guys, have you tried this? This is really friggin' fun. Leading GE Aerospace to create real 3D and partnering with Sega, yes, that one, on the Model 2 and Model 3 to deliver some mind-blowing graphics for the time. Then in 1993, G Aerospace was sold to Lockheed Martin, where Martin Marietta also got hooked on the video games and decided to double down on them, not just increasing their partnership with Sega, but also partnering with Intel to create the most incredible graphics card the world had ever seen, codenamed Project Auburn. The hype for Auburn was real, with everyone assuming that the incredible resources and expertise at Intel's disposal would completely destroy 3D effects in NVIDIA. Until Auburn hit the market. In February of 1998, the Intel 740 was launched for only $3450, and even at that price, it stunk. The performance was abysmal compared to the 3D effects Voodoo 2, and by the end of the year, everyone had basically forgotten about it. This mistake ultimately led to Lockheed Martin bailing on the project and real 3D closing. Intel bought the IP and tried to have another go at it with the i742 and i744, but they never reached acceptable levels of performance and it didn't make it to the market. Some of this IP lives on in Intel's current day iGPUs, which might explain why they sucked for so long, and Intel's dreams of creating a sweet graphics card for gamers were crushed. Many years went by, Vesher released Ya, yeah, Halo brought first-person shooters to the masses, and Linus's voice stayed exactly the same. Until 2008, when Intel announced Project Larrabee. Once again, the Intel graphics hype was in full force, with Intel claiming that their demonstration of an overclocked unit was the first ever public demonstration of a single chip system exceeding one teraflop. But the stunt did not impress Nvidia, who called it a marketing puff, and Peter Glukowski saying it was like a GPU from 2006. To get the full scoop on Larrabee, check out Linus's video where he gets hands on with a real sample, but how the story ends is why I'm still a bit skeptical about Intel's current DG1. The TLDW is that Larrabee was a total success, just not as a gaming graphics card, but instead as a general compute processor. The project lived on for 10 years as Xeon Phi, a platform that allowed for loads of CPU cores to be slot into a single supercomputer and can easily handle massive calculations. It was actually used to create the world's fastest supercomputer in 2013. So this move of Intel being like, oh, hey guys, we're gonna make a great GPU, psych, is why when Intel announced that they would be getting back into dedicated graphics in 2017, my first thought was, well, that'll be great in 2020 for AI researchers. This feeling was reaffirmed when Intel announced that they would be partnering with the US Department of Energy to deliver the world's first exascale computer. And a little while later, there were rumors that the performance of the consumer GPU was underperforming. Which brings us to yesterday, when I saw Intel's reps bring out a working sample of the Intel DG1. And I was at first excited, 
until I saw it being used. Intel's sample was Warframe, which is running right behind us, and I don't need an FPS counter to tell me that it's dropping below 60 FPS. And I couldn't help but feel that we've seen this song and dance before. Loads of hype, a prototype that isn't quite there but seems promising, only for the consumer side of the project to be canned down the line. The thing is though, I still think that this is the most important demo of CES 2020, even if we never end up getting a graphics card that destroys Radeon or Nvidia, since I think that would be really missing the point. Intel's big advantage here is going to be the integration of their CPUs and what they can do for mobile devices. The way Turbo Boost can squeeze every last megahertz of stability and every degree of cooling in thin light machines is incredible. Add that control to the GPU of a mobile device and the tightrope walk of available power and cooling between the CPU and GPU simultaneously to give us the kind of gaming experience that you currently get in big 15 inch laptops down in like a little 13 inch two pounder. Or turn something like the Alienware Project UFO into a real beast. The best part is that is the worst possible scenario. We've already seen a massive increase in graphics performance on Ice Lake, and Intel claims that the performance will be doubled for Tiger Lake. As Intel ships the DG1 out to software makers, this year hopefully we'll see the performance of this increase a lot, and maybe we'll get something to compete with Nvidia. But even if we don't, it's going to be an awesome couple of years for gaming on Thin and Lights. See, that's the thing. You can't tell the difference between when I'm working and when I'm just writing fan fictions and reviews of movies that bothered me because of Pulseway. Pulseway is the app that allows you to remotely monitor and manage your systems in real time. So from just one app, you can scan, install, update your systems by sending commands, you can deploy custom scripts, and it's compatible with Mac, Windows, and of course Linux, making your IT life easier than you could have possibly imagined. So don't wait, check out Pulseway. You can try it for free at the link in the video description, and also at that link, you can save 20% on their Teams plan. So thanks for watching, and make sure you get subscribed to find out just how well Intel does in the future, because I'm pretty excited to see what comes out of all of this. See ya.